shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. We sing it again.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face Not for 
forsaken I've been set free I've been set free Amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me Whoa, I once was lost But now Welcome to CCF Online. We have life groups on Sunday at 6 p.m. and on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. We also have Celebrate Recovery on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. CCM donations of non-perishable food and gently used clothing are needed. Have a blessed week, guys. And remember, Jesus loves you. Let the king of 
Good morning, church, and welcome to CCS Online Service. I'm glad you are here. If you are with us last week, you know we started in the book of 2 Peter, and we went through the first 11 verses of chapter 1. And Peter was reminding us to remember what Jesus Christ did on the cross to cleanse us of our sins. And he encouraged us to grow in our knowledge of him. Because when we gave our life to Christ, His Holy Spirit enters inside of us and we get the privilege of partaking in His divine nature. And as we partake in His divine nature, and the Holy Spirit will help to add to our faith the things that we need to be added as we follow the Holy Spirit and live out His will for our life and not our own. And this week, we're going to cover verses 12 through 15. And I labeled this message, How to Live in the Die Well. And I understand that this could be an alarming title for some. The first part is not so alarming, how to live, right? We all want to be able to live well. That, that is important to most of us. And most, and most people would agree with Socrates when he said, the, the unexamined life is not worth living. But the second idea of how to die well is equally as significant. In the words of the immoral great theogen, Captain Kirk, he says this, has it ever occurred to you that how we deal with death is at least as important as how we deal with life? I mean, did you know, for instance, uh, the early Puritans believed the aim of every person should be to die well. They said that meant embracing one's own death one's own demise, one's own terminal condition, while having their wits about them and remaining faithful to God. Now, one of the most noble examples of someone who lived well and died well was a guy named Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was a disciple of John, of the Apostle John. And he lived in a time and died in a time where martyrism was at an all-time high. And he, of course, was arrested because of his faith, when he was 86 years old. And when he was arrested, the words that came out of his mouth were these, May the will of the Lord be done. And as he was taken into Roman custody, they tried to get him to repent of his faith in Jesus Christ. They said, come on, how hard can it be to just say, Caesar is Lord? But Polycarp, his response was, you know, For 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And this served to just irk the Romans further, and the Roman executioner said to to Polycarp, I'm going to put you in in the fire, and the fire is going to be hot. And you know what Polycarp's response was? He says, you threatened me with fire that burns for an hour. And you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment, the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Now, how's that for last words? How's that for living well and dying well? Here's a man who embraced it, who had his wits about him, and who was faithful to the very end. Now, Solomon. Now, Solomon is supposed to be the wisest person in the Bible besides maybe Jesus Christ himself. When God told Solomon that he was going to give him anything he asked for, and Solomon asked for wisdom. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, 
This is what he said. He says there is a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And you know, in between that time to be born and the time to die is what we call life. We are creatures of time and we are bound for eternity. And Peter continuously reminds us to think heavenly word because we are bound for eternity. So the question that we have to face is this. How will we spend our time to make it count for eternity? And with that question in mind, let's begin in chapter uh, 1 of 2 Peter verses 12 through 15. Well, I'm going to read the, the whole uh, four verses that we're covering today. Then we're going to break it down. So verses 12 through 15 says, For this reason, I will not be neglectant to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decrease. Now in this short paragraph, only four verses, Peter gives us some keys to us on what it means to live and to die well. And many of you may know the artist and inventor Leonardo da Vinci. And these are his words. He says, As a day well spent brings a happy sleep, so a life well used brings a happy death. So how do you live well and how do you die well? Well, let me give you some keys as we look at the text and as we look at Peter's life and how he lives out his life and how we can take the example of how Peter lives and apply it to our life. First of all, Peter lived with death in mind. Peter lived with death in mind. And I know that sounds foreign to say that, especially maybe for the younger people. But life, it needs to be lived with death in mind. I mean, who does that? Well, Peter does that. In fact, through the entire passage that we're covering today, he's aware of his looming death. And it's prevalent throughout this passage. Let me show you. But first, let me go back to verse 11 that we covered last week. He says, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, he's pointing us to be heavenly focused. That, hey, one day we're going to go to heaven. But he follows this up with verse 12. He says, For this reason, I will not be neglectant to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. See, he says, for this reason. For what reason? For the reason that he wrote in verse 11. For this reason, one day entering into heaven, right? For this very reason, this is why I write to you and I say to you, it's pretty much what Peter is saying, because there is an eternal destination that all of us will go to. And he says, I will not be neglectant to remind you always of these things, though you know. Even though these readers did know the truth, in light of what is at stake, the eternal destiny, it is worth to go over it again and again. And you think about it. You know, I used to play basketball. And a basketball team who's going for a championship will practice the same fundamentals over and over and over again. They do this even though they know the techniques because they want the victory. So for this reason, Christians should never get tired of hearing the basics of Christian of the Christian life, and that is that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross, and that He rose again on the third day. That's the basics of the Christian life. And Peter, and, and many times throughout the New Testament, were constantly reminded of this fact. We should rejoice every time Jesus Christ and his gospel and the plan for our lives is preached. And he says, established in this present truth. So we're established in this present truth. And this established, uh, it can be the same word translated strengthened in Luke 22, verse 32, 
where Jesus told Peter, when you are returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So here, as he's writing to the Christians, he, here, Peter fulfills the command of Jesus. He would establish and strengthen them by reminding them of the basics of the Christian life. And another thing I want us to notice is found in verses 13 and 14. He says, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decrease. See, because what is at stake, Peter knew it was right to remind people constantly, especially because he knew that his days on earth were coming to an end. In verse 14, he says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. And he's not talking about an actual tent that he lives in, but he's metaphorically taking, talking about his body. And we'll talk about more about that as we go on today. But he also says, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. So evidently, Jesus, the Lord, revealed to Peter that he didn't have much time left, that he was going to die. And Peter speaks of his death twice in these verses. Once he speaks about it in verse 14, he says, putting off my tent. And then very plainly, when he says in verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my what? After my decrease. And decrease, he means this is the, his death. And he wanted to be sure to pin down these things so that even after his, his decrease, even after he dies, that they can go back to his writings and be encouraged and be nourished and be strengthened by it. But this word for decrease is very interesting. It's, it means exodus. And if you think about Exodus, we know the book of Exodus where Moses, uh, it was the people moving from Egypt into the wilderness and eventually the promised land. And it, he says his decrease, and when he means Exodus, he means that he's leaving one place on our way, on his way to another place. It's as if he's saying, I'm leaving this earth and I'm on my way to heaven. And in this entire passage, Peter is living his life with his own death in mind. Now, admittedly, Peter, when he wrote this, was in his 70s. And in saying that, some of you might immediately be thinking, well, that makes sense that he would think about his death in mind when he was in his 70s. But I'm in my 20s or I'm in my 30s. Nobody really thinks about that stuff. Now, I admit that might be true but it's not always healthy. There's a, a pastor named Gordon McDonald who, who advised pastors and worship leaders whenever they're speaking to crowds, they ought to speak aware of the multiple age groups that are involved. That different people who are coming in think different thoughts. For example, he said this, somebody in their 20s, among other things, when they get together will think thoughts like this. What makes me unique? How am I different from others around me? What is my, where is my life heading? These are questions that dominate someone who may be in their 20s. And he also says, and people in their 30s, they, they think a little differently because there's marriages and mortgages involved, right? So questions are, are in the 30-year-old's mind might be this, how will I get all the things done that I'm responsible for? Or questions like, what happens? What happened to all the fun I used to have in my 20s? Where did that go? And he says, when you get to your 40s, questions rattle around your mind like, why are my peers doing better than I am? And you start comparing yourself with others. You give a self-report card, so to speak. And questions like, why is my marriage less dazzling than it used to be in my 30s? And once you get to your 50s, questions might come up. Do young people think I'm obsolete? Or questions like, why is my body becoming increasingly unreliable? And when you get to your 60s, questions that might come to mind is, why do my peers look older than me? You know, I hope I ask myself that when I'm in my 60s. Or why do my friends talk so much about death? 
And when you get to your 70s and above, like we see Peter here, frequently these questions surface. How many years do I have left? When will I die? How will I die? Does anyone know who I once was? These are questions of significance. So admittedly, the older you get, the more you think about the end of your life. You think about death. But I'm telling you, it's unwise to wait that long. It is wiser to live with death in mind. As a matter of fact, did you know Solomon? Remember Solomon, the guy we just talked about who God uh, granted him wisdom? About, he asked for wisdom from God. Well, he wrote in Ecclesiastes. He says, it's better to go to a funeral than go to a party. Now, let me give you the exact verses. This is Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2. He says, it's better to spend your time at a funeral than at festivals. For you are going to die, and you should think about it while there's still time. And if you go two verses down from that, in verse 4, he says, a wise person thinks much about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time now. And as you get to the end of, chapter, of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, in verse 1, he says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before those days become difficult, and dust will return to the earth. Now, did you get his advice? Going to a funeral is better than going to a party. Taking a stroll in a cemetery can be more helpful than a weekend in Vegas. And here's why it's important. When you at least spend time thinking about the end of your life, whatever that will be, you don't know, right? You don't know when you're going to die. But whatever that you do, you're dealing with now with the basics. And when you think about that stuff, when you think about death, you get real. You become real. First of all, because you don't know when, when it's going to come, right? You don't know when you're, it's going to come. Nobody plans this stuff typically, right? I mean, I've never seen someone put on their calendar, I'm going to have breakfast at 8.30. I'm going to leave for work at 9 o'clock. I have a business meeting at, at 10 o'clock. I'm going to eat lunch at 12 o'clock. And then at 2 o'clock, I'm going to die. Nobody plans this stuff typically. Yet the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for every man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. See, the fact is this. God has made an appointment for your death. The problem is he didn't tell you when that appointment is going to be, so we don't know. And you may have heard the joke that about a man who died and went to heaven. And he got to heaven, he saw how beautiful and how wonderful it is. And then he sees his wife who, who died many years before him. And he comes to his wife and says, you know, I would have gotten here sooner if you wouldn't have made me eat all that healthy food. See, the truth is, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't have any kind of way to predict that exactly, usually, right? But when you think about it, you get real. Because you don't know when it's going to come. And second, because you're thinking about it makes you live more wisely. I mean, let me give you an example. Let's say you go to a lawyer. Let's say you go to a lawyer and, and you have one hour with a lawyer. And he says, this is going to cost you $250 per hour. So, okay, the clock starts. You have, your hour begins. Do you immediately ask non-important questions like, well, tell me how you were, you were brought up. Tell me about your upbringing. See, no, you could care less about that person's upkeep, upkeeping, upbringing at that time, right? You don't care about the weather or what's going on. You want to get down to business and what you came to that lawyer to talk about because you only have an hour. You want to make sure that you spend that hour because you're thinking about how much it's going to cost you. You're going to use it wisely. So when you start thinking about your life in terms of that, you know what? This lifetime, well, it's going to cost me my life. You start thinking and planning. And that is crucial. That's, that's important for us to do. So the first takeaway that I want us to see as we look at Peter's life is he lives his life with death in mind, and we should as he did. This theme is throughout 1 uh, Peter and 2 Peter, looking past this life to eternity and living like it. 
And the second thought, the second thing I want us to take out at looking at Peter's life in these verses is live your life as a camper. Live your life as like you're camping out. You're camping out. You're, you're, when you're camping, uh, it means that you're, it's not permanent. Realizing that this isn't our home, right? Let's look at verses 13 and 14. He says, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this, what? Tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that surely I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. See, Peter uses the word tent twice in these verses. He says, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, speaking of his body, to stir you up and to remind you, knowing that I must put off my tent. And Peter, this is a, a familiar metaphor that he uses of the human body being what they uh, in this time saw so often uh, around that part of the world as nomads living in tents, temporary shelters on their way from one place to another. So when a person dies, it's like taking down one's tent. And for us today, in our modern world, it's a camping metaphor. And Peter isn't the only one that uses this tent metaphor. We also see Paul using the same metaphor when speaking about death. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, Paul says this, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house made with hands, eternal in the heavens. See, Paul was a tent maker. It makes sense that he would make up this metaphor of being a tent maker. But Peter was a fisherman. But he knew the same metaphor. And when we think about camping, when we think about tents, right? Tents is something temporary. They're flimsy. They're not beautiful, Right? And when you think about camping, you, you, you go down to the basics, right? You get down to the bare minimum. You don't take five suitcases with you when you go camping, right? You usually just have a backpack full of the essentials. You realize how much stuff you can live without. But also what is true, at least when I go camping, is I can't wait to go back home and sleep in my own bed, and to sleep in my own house, and take a shower, and be in the comforts of my own home. I can't wait to get home by the end of my camping trip. See, our bodies, like a tent, is temporary. After a while, the threads unravel, the flaps get worn out, and the tent leaks. We have a tendency to try to make our tents last forever, but in reality, that can't happen. In James 4.14, 4, it says, Whereas we don't know what will happen tomorrow, for what is this life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You think about our life compared to eternity, and our life it, it only it can be this big compared to the eternity that we awaits us. In John 14, verse 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If there were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. See, the real you isn't your earthly tent. The real you is your spirit. And after a while, the body, this tent that I'm living in, stops being helpful. And one day, when what we call death happens, the movers will come in and you will move from one place to another. You will make your own exodus, a departure taking down your tent. And that is the best way to view death. And it's not accurate to say that a believer's die. It's more accurate to say that they moved. Philippians 1 verse 21 says this, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And only believers can make that statement. Thus, we should live our life as campers. Like it says in Hebrews 11, verse 16, desiring a better country, that is a heavenly country. And this brings me to my final point as we look at Peter's life in these verses. Live your life 
for the benefit of others. Don't make your life all about this earthly tent. You can send supplies up ahead for what is getting prepared for you by Jesus in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says this, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. See, what we have to understand is you can start decorating the house that Jesus is preparing for you now. And how do you do that? You do that living your life as Peter does and living for the benefit of others. Peter lived for the benefit of others. So as we look at these verses again, verses 12 through 15, we see that Peter lived for the benefit of others in two different ways. One, by reminding them of the things they should already know. And two, by waking them up. First, he reminds them in verse 12. Again, we go over this again. It says, for this reason, I will not be neglected to remind you always of these things, even though you know and are established in the present truth. See, as we go through the New Testament, through Scripture, we're constantly reminded of what Jesus did on the cross and reminded of the basic Christian life. And a good teacher will do this, right? You know, and, and if you hear a teacher repeating himself, it means it's important. So remembering the basics of Christian life is important. And Jesus himself often repeated himself in parables and in sermons. And Solomon, he certainly did this in Proverbs. You know, we have in our life group that meets on, on, um, on Sunday nights, we're going over Proverbs. And we hear the same themes uh, going that, that Solomon repeats over and over again. And David, he does it in Psalms. See, we need to be reminded. Why? Because sometimes we simply forget. I forget. You can forget. And virtually every study on learning I have ever found gives that, we, that statistics uh, are on re retention. It says the average person, at best, even if you're locked into a message, can only remember about 25% of what is said. And some experts say that that's only if you hear it twice. So you have to listen to what I'm saying here and then again on the podcast to get 25% or better retention on what is being said. But it's also said that you retain 45% if you see it and hear it. And 70% if you see it, hear it, and do it. That's why God's word said, don't be merely hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. And that's why uh, we offer uh, life groups and we tell people to get involved in life groups and get involved in Celebrate Recovery because the more you can interact over that truth and reinforce it in your life, it is better for you to retain it. Now, I imagine that a lot of you may have experienced this and I know I have. You know, maybe you've been in your Bibles and you've underlined something or, you, you know, for me, I'm in, in my, my Bible app and I'm highlighting something. And then months go by or maybe years go by and I, and I go back to that verse and I see what I highlighted and I'm encouraged by that again because I, I've forgotten it or I needed that encouragement again. It's important to be reminded of things and Peter is constantly reminding us and that's how he shows that he cares for others. And the second thing that Peter does to uh, care for other people is done by waking them up. In verse 13, it says, Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. See, to stir you up could be translated to arouse, awake up from drowsiness. Right? Sometimes it's easy to become drowsy in the light of the gospel truth, and we need to be woken up. We need to be aware of the dangers of what's going on around us. That's what he talks about in 1 Peter. He talks about being aware of the dangers of the outside world, persecution, and that there's going to be suffering that you will endure in this life. 
And in 2 Peter, he's going to continue to warn us about the dangers of, of such things like false prophets and false teachers in the church. And we need to be woken up and aware of these things. So he wants to steer, steer us up. See, Peter is living for others to remind them as well as stirring them up. But here's the greater point. Peter is nearing his death. His departure is near. He is in his 70s, but he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about others. And that's the point I want to leave you with. He is thinking about others. He lives his life for others. Instead of becoming consumed, as so often happens when you're about to die or when you're getting older, we just sort of think about how I'm doing. How am I going to die? What's going to happen to me? Is that he is thinking about others. And after 2,000 years, we are still being instructed and nourished by First and Second Peter. So my question is for us today, is what are you leaving behind? What is your legacy? What are you leaving for the next generation? Are you passing your faith to the next generation? If you're going to live well and die well, if I'm going to live well and die well, then I would do well and you would do well in following after Peter's footsteps, in living with death in mind, living like you're camping out, knowing that heaven is your true home, that this earth isn't your true home and live for the benefit of others. Now let me pray to that end. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you. Thank you for men like Peter that can give us examples. Lord, help us not wait until we're in our 70s and or 80s or beyond to, to live our life with death in mind. See, living our life, help us to live our life as a camper, knowing that our true home isn't this tent, this bodily tent that we live in on this earth, but our true home is being set up for us in heaven by you. And Lord, let us live our lives for the benefit of others, doing as Peter does and, and constantly reminding people of the basics of Christianity, that he loved us so much he loved us so much that you came to this earth and died on a cross and you rose again, conquering death, proving once and for all you were the Son of God. Lord, let us not grow tired of hearing that truth and reminding people and reminding ourselves of that truth because it will help us when the enemy attacks and help us as we remember this to forgive others as you forgave us. So Lord, help us to remember, help us to live our lives as nomads, as campers, with death in mind, and living our lives for others. I pray these things in your name, amen. All right, guys, I thank you for tuning in today, and I hope you have an amazing week. And remember to live your life for others, remembering Jesus Christ, and remembering that your home isn't here, it's in heaven. Be blessed. See you next week, God willing. From the dryness of the waiting To the blessings overpour Your plan is unrevealed still So I trust you even more I know I don't deserve it But you give yourself away Still my heart to know you Within you I remain You're my refuge in the sun I'm gone.
for me The beginning and the end Though I nearly tasted death You gave me life instead I know I don't deserve it But you give yourself The grave was, it was borrowed, so I...